incredible science going on with a ketone-fueled brain, and there's so many positive things likely uh, emanating from that. But I'm going to focus on, on muscle, and I'm going to start first here with um, some data on keto adaptation and glycogen metabolism. And showing you a graph here from uh, a study we published back, I believe it was 2015, uh, in an elite group of ultra-endurance athletes that were either following a traditional high-carbohydrate or a traditional low-carbohydrate diet. I'm not going to go through all the data in that paper, but the low-carb athletes were prodigious fat burners. They had twice the level of fat oxidation and um, performed a three-hour bout of exercise using about 90% fat compared to the high-carb athletes, which were using more along the lines of 40 or 50% fat. Uh, but what was act absolutely astonishing uh, to me uh, was that their resting glycogen their post-exercise glycogen and their recovery glycogen levels were almost exactly the same. And, uh, and you're seeing the individual responses here. So there's also a remarkable homogeneity in the responses here. There's no real outliers. Um, and, and then this is in the context of these low-carb athletes eating a very low amount of carbohydrate. So quite unexpected because I think we're, we're taught that to maintain optimal glycogen levels, you need to be consuming a lot of the exogenous carbohydrate. So how, how, could, this, you know, how could this happen? Uh, it, so first of all, if you look at the rate of glycogen breakdown and calculate that out, um, you know, again, it's nearly identical. No difference at all between low carb and high carb uh, in terms of glycogen utilized per unit time. And if you, but if you do the math here, there's something quite odd. Um, so if you kind of make a few assumptions here in terms of uh, you know, the, the uh, amount of active tissue involved, uh, you can calculate it in actual gram amounts how much glycogen was utilized. So based on these calculations, about 160 grams of glycogen was depleted during exercise. But we actually have indirect calorimetry data on the total amount of glucose oxidized that actually was terminally oxidized to, to generate ATP. And that was only around 60, a little over 60 grams. So the big question is, what the heck happened to 100 grams of glycogen if it can't be accounted for in breath and glucose oxidation? And I'm not sure I have the answer. It's, uh, it really has not been followed up on. But if we take a look here, um, drill down a little deeper into the biochemistry. So you've got glycogen break, broken down into glucose and then, of course, glycolysis. And typically, if you look at the end product of glycolysis, pyruvate, uh, a lot of that is being converted to acetyl-CoA through pyruvate dehydrogenase, and that's the entry point into the Krebs cycle for terminal oxidation. And of course, fatty acids can also serve as a source of acetyl-CoA. But we know that ketogenic diets actually decrease PDH activity, uh, and most of the acetyl-CoA that's being used to generate ATP is coming from fatty acids because you have an abundance of fatty acids when you're keto-adapted. So that's why I kind of have that read it out. Um, it's unlikely a lot of pyruvate is going in that direction. But pyruvate can also, it has other fates. So it can be converted into oxaloacetate. And this is interesting because oxaloacetate is necessary. It's kind of an anaphylactic substrate for the Krebs cycle. You need oxaloacetate uh, for the Krebs cycle to run. In fact, I don't know if, if it's still in the textbooks or not, but you, I was taught that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, when you think about it. Um, but the basis of that was that if you're uh, burning fat, you have to have a source of oxaloacetate. And typically, oxaloacetate is, de is derived from, from glucose. So that's where that comes from, even though it doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's likely perhaps one reason why in a keto-adapted state, you need to have a fully functioning Krebs cycle that perhaps breaking down glycogen and going through glycolysis 
helps keep the Krebs cycle running by providing a source of oxaloacetate. Pyruvate could also be converted to lactate, uh, and that also, I have that, you know, green, because I think that likely occurs to a greater extent in these keto-adapted athletes, and lactate is a great, you know, source of carbon uh, for the cell and can even be used directly as an energy source. And then you also have this sort of other pathway parallel to glycolysis, uh, the pentose phosphate pathway, and that produces some important um, products as well, like reducing equivalents, uh, NADPH, as well as uh, five carbon sugars that are necessary for nucleotide synthesis, for RNA DNA repair. So there could be advantages to having a source of glucose in the keto adapted state in terms of promoting reducing power and and five carbon sugars as well. So I think this is all hypothetical, but all reasons why, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, being keto adapted, um, you still might want to have normal glycogen levels, typical glycogen levels. Uh, 